and supply our teachers with at least computers and laptops. So that when they are computer literate, they can transfer knowledge to those who are here to come. Unfortunately, our minister was passed by parliament. He's minister for education. I'm sure by now they are looking for the businessman that will supply these laptops at a higher percentage. They call it what? 10%. So that they will get their share. They will distribute to our people. Bisu is sitting down. We are not crying foul. If we don't cry that that policy is a bankrupt, bogus policy and that it will not help people of rural communities, who should cry for us? Who should cry for us? The students have to take up the challenge, first and important. These who have to take up the challenge and begin to probe every educational policy that our government turned out. It is only when we are able to exercise concerted effort and speaking with one voice, not only as Bisu, but also as Northern Students Union, as Upper East Students Union, as Upper West Students Union. Then our people at Central Government will know that we no go sit down and make them cheat us forever. So how do we reverse it? The first challenge goes to our students. Start to speak. And speak with the confidence and energy that you have. As young people, if you begin to meddle in what I call uncle some politics, go and chop here small and go and chop here small. The NPP people come, you go and hide and get something from NPP. NDC people are coming, you go and hide and get. The honorable MP is coming. You go and hide and get something. Now when his opponent is coming, you go in the night. And go and tell them, ah, when the MP came, he gave me five cities. So if you want me to get some people for you, you have to give me ten cities. That negative politics will not endure to the benefit of our younger generation who are not here. All of you, my brothers and sisters, rise up and begin to speak. My second challenge is to our Honorable MP. Fortunately, you are close to the President because in your opening statement, you brought us greetings from the President. When you return to Accra, Honorable MP, Honorable MP, when you return to Accra, tell Mr. President that the constituency that you represent has suffered three main challenges. We've suffered colonialism, we've suffered slavery, and we are currently suffering discrimination and apartheid. And that our people cannot accept this any longer. And that we have seen, and these days, fortunately, we watch on television, what Southern Ghana looks like and what Northern Ghana looks like. And that not only for his presidential and your parliamentary votes, but also for the development needs of our people, he ought to speed up. My second area of concern is to the chiefs. It's difficult to talk when the chiefs are around. But you see, I told you I was not going to be diplomatic. So now that we talk about the chiefs, I'll face this direction. <laughs> The chiefs. Didn't we see what the Western Region chiefs did? We saw it. They went. Oil is to be extracted in the water. It's not on their land. It's from the water. And the water is the sea. And we are digging the water, uh, oil from the, the sea. It's not that we are going to chop their land in any way. But you see what they did? They quickly marched up, wrote a petition to Parliament, did a press conference, demanding 10% of oil revenue. Our chiefs. For our people to get better education, our young students to become better. I want to see that you also demand from our central government that they should compensate us for the indignity we suffered 
violent slavery, colonialism, and the current apartheid that we are suffering. And that of the GDP of Ghana, people of northern extraction still contribute more than 60% of it. Apart from the fact that we are into agriculture and produce to feed the nation, we are also the same people working in the cocoa farms and that they are using that to build scholarship for cocoa farm owners, not the farmers. And that we are in the gold mines, we are in the forest, producing all the wealth of our nation. So of the GDP of our nation, we also demand at least 10% of that GDP for the development of the North. Because other chiefs are demanding it. Why must our chief keep quiet? And I have learned very early in life that if you want something, you better make some noise. So from the family that I come from, were so many that they will come and share and forget about you. And if you didn't make noise, they will not recognize that you even exist. So let our chiefs also make some noise now so that central government will know that we are not sleeping and that our people deserve better development. Our DC is gone. But you see, central government owed it to our people to ensure that we have improved infrastructure. They know that they owe it to our people to ensure that we have better agriculture and that we have irrigation. How can a country like Ghana be importing rice? Honorable them. We imported rice in 2008-2009 to the tune of 600 million US dollars. And where we come from is the farming community. And I have sold government that when you import rice worth 600 million US dollars, what you have done is that you have exported employment worth 600 million dollars to those countries and imported unemployment worth 600 million US dollars. It's simple. If you want to explain. You see, if you put 600 million dollars and you go and start in Ghana and you give it to our rice farmers, they can produce the rice in Ghana. And in producing the rice, they will employ our students who are going to do accounting to come and become accountants in the rice farm. They will employ our students who are going to do human resource management to come there so that they will be the human resource people to identify proper and qualified accountants. They will employ the engineers to come and be in the farm so that we'll be able to produce and ensure that our machines are working. In effect, those farms will not be meant for the peasants. They will be farms on large scale that will assure our people of continuous growth, not only in the agriculture sector, but also in our education sector. Because if our people have money, they will not wait for government to come and put up houses for us. Is there any government house here? These are privately owned houses. And so our people know what to do. And here, we don't sleep outside like we sleep rough in Accra. So when you deny our young graduates who are supposed to be employed by these farmers, and you take the money, and you run and go and import Chicago star rice, or what do they call it? Uncle Ben's rice. The rice master and all that nonsense. What you have done effectively is that you have denied our people of employment, you have denied them of income, you have increased our poverty and therefore increasing our conflict. Central government has a responsibility to stop this. And when they stop, our people will become better. Civil society and all of us, let us take the challenge and work hard to improve the lot of our people. When we do this, we'll be able to advance the cause of people. Finally, in all these, leadership is key. Who is going to lead us? Let them lead us well. Let us, those people speak what is supposed to be ours. And when they do so, we will not be accepting partial development as development. When they do so, will also be demanding our rights and not privileges. Now, Chairman, I thank you.